straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Actor Danny Masterson skips a court appearance, but his attorneys are there to argue on his behalf as he faces rape charges. The family of Lacey Peterson is outraged that ex-husband Scott Peterson may get a new trial. And a New York trial judge captured on camera in a tussle with police. Law & Crime Daily covers court cases. Law & Crime Daily, I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. Charges against that 70s show actor Danny Masterson are moving forward in California. Masterson is accused of raping three women in his home between 2001 and 2003. The women came forward three years ago, but Masterson was arrested just three months ago. Masterson is out on more than $3 million bond and has waived his appearance in court. His attorneys asked a judge to dismiss the charges before he entered a plea. They argued in what's called a demurrer hearing that the allegations are too old and can't be prosecuted because they fall outside the legal statute of limitations. This could create all sorts uh, of issues for, for defendants that can be tried with cases that where someone comes forward and then the prosecution is allowed to just sit back and wait any sort of number of years for multiple victims to come forward, uh, multiple alleged complainants to come forward, and wait to file these cases 20 years down the road. These cases are so old um, that they have outrun the statute of limitations, which was whether you find it to be six or 10 years, would have expired at the latest at the end of 2013. Um, under 261A2, this case is no longer able to go forward, and this court just does not have jurisdiction. So we would ask for this court to sustain our demur and to dismiss the case. Prosecutors say the allegations against the three, involving rather the three women, are being charged under California's one strike law, which is why Masterson is facing a possible sentence of up to life in prison. The judge agreed with them. It is uh, there's no statute of limitations, so people can file it um, under certain guidelines, certainly. But um, there's no five-year, six-year, ten-year statute. As it is alleged, and you have the three victims, I believe their penal code section 799, subsection A, there is no statute of limitations. So therefore, your motion is based on uh, lack of jurisdiction because of being on the, beyond the statute, that is denied. Masterson's defense also requested a hearing to question the sufficiency of the evidence in this case. The judge denied that request. Some more um, and some other language that you use, at least in your initial demur, that um, lack of due diligence in the investigation, the witnesses have died, memories have faded, exculpatory evidence is lost, and therefore the defendant has been prejudiced. Then in your reply, you say, well, wait a minute, I'm not really making that argument yet. Um, so there is no just kind of general due process argument. So I, I, I would deny it on that ground. But without prejudice, obviously, because you pointed out a lot has to be done in this case with regard to that. Carrie Antholis is a reporter who's been following this case. Carrie, good to see you here on Law & Crime Daily. What's the scope of the accusations? How deep does this case go? There are three witnesses, three alleged victims that have come forward. Um, and in, the, you know, in each of those cases, the allegation is rape, sexual assault. And um, the part of the demur that uh, Masterson's attorneys were arguing for was that the statute of limitations for one single sexual assault is, uh, I believe it's 10 years, or I believe it's 10 years. And, um, but the one strike law, uh, as you said, um, does not, you know, there is no statute of limitations for a crime that uh, carries a life sentence. And because Masterson's been charged with three rapes, if there are more than one, if there's more than one rape alleged, then there is no statute of limitations for multiple uh, crime of multiple or multiple rape charges. So, um, the defense, that's, uh, so that's why. 
Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the defense certainly put that on the record. That explains how the prosecution is able to get around the statute of limitations. Now, I want to ask about this, too. There are some links to Scientology which are being reported, but this criminal case does not directly involve that church. But, of course, we have other litigation surrounding this defendant, and that's where the links come in, to my understanding, correct? Yes, there's, there's a, a civil complaint. There's a civil case that involves four alleged victims. Um, and uh, and the Church of Scientology is one of the named uh, defendants in that case, um, along with a number of other uh, friends and and um, uh, acquaintances of of Mr. Masterson. Um, the there two of the victims in that case have put their names on the case. The other two are referred to as Jane Doe's. In the criminal complaint, all three victims are Jane Doe's. So a lot of litigation for you to track in this case. Carrie, I know you're going to continue to follow it. Thanks so much. And, um, yeah, you can, you can check out our coverage at, at crimestory.com. Certainly will do. Let's bring Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin in now to discuss some of the legal aspects of this. So, Brian, any hints as to the broader defense strategy here? What should the defense be doing, in your opinion? I think right now the defense is doing exactly what they should be, and that's focusing on any legal arguments that might be able to dismantle this case. The perfect one is a statute of limitations. The next step here is to get as much discovery as possible and try to do further litigation to narrow the scope of the evidence that could possibly be presented to a jury. And Terry, any sense of what the prosecutors should be doing now? Should they just be doing more of the same because they're basically winning? Well, they have to make sure that they stay under the California's one strike law, meaning that they have to have aggravated circumstances here. So none of the case is dropped. So making sure that they have either, you know, young victims or multiple victims. And here they do have multiple victims with a possible life sentence. So I think they'll be able to survive that challenge at this point in time. So, Brian, when we listen to the defense argument there, it ultimately didn't end with a win for the defense on the statute of limitations. But the defense obviously has to make the argument, and we need to point that out as well. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it this way. Yes, are we all disgusted by allegations of rape? But if rape allegations are false, do you not want an individual to take every legal attempt to prove that? And you've got to err on the side of that's a possibility, especially if you're a defense attorney. And statute of limitations arguments, even if they don't necessarily go anywhere, you've got to at least put them on the record as a defense attorney or you're not doing your job. Exactly. It's ineffective assistance of counsel. Yeah, then you're in trouble, and uh, it, it's even bigger problem than uh, just getting a denial for an argument. So that's why we watch those go by. Let's move on now, because still ahead here on Law & Crime Daily, singer Phil Collins takes a legal step to kick his ex-wife out of his house. And later on, we dig further into body camera footage of George Floyd being arrested a year before his fatal encounter with the police. What's the defense trying to prove here? More on that when we return. Several other legal celebrities, I should say, are facing legal trouble. Pop legend Phil Collins takes his ex-wife to court, hoping to get her kicked out of his $40 million mansion in Miami Beach. Collins and his ex-wife divorced 14 years ago, but Collins claims they got back together when they were an item in 2015. Ex-wife married another man two months ago, and Collins claims the new couple moved into his place without permission and has even hired armed guards to patrol the property. The singer and drummer calls that move outrageous. A former child star from the sitcom Home Improvement spending time in jail over the weekend on accusations he strangled his girlfriend. Police in Eugene, Oregon went to 39-year-old Zachary Ty Bryan's house Friday night for a report of a dispute. Officers said Bryan choked his girlfriend and took her cell phone, but she refused medical treatment. Brian was booked into the county jail where that mugshot was taken. A judge is refusing to admit body camera evidence of George Floyd's unrelated 2019 arrest into evidence in the upcoming trials of four officers accused of murdering Floyd this year. The 2019 video shows Floyd fighting with, but ultimately complying with, police officers. The defense argued that the video proves the police handled Floyd properly when he agreed to get into a squad car because no one was hurt in this 2019 encounter. In this video, Floyd admitted he was struggling with addiction and had taken as many as eight pills. Here's more of the interaction. George, listen to me. Listen to me. I need you to relax. We are not going to jail right now, okay? 
So I need you to relax. Okay? George, relax. The video goes on to show officers removing Floyd's cuffs. They ultimately took him for treatment where his blood pressure was dangerously high. The defense is accusing prosecutors of presenting a so-called false narrative of who George Floyd really was, and they say this video proves more of their side of the story. The defense, for the four officers accused of killing Floyd, argued that this footage proves Floyd would be alive today had he agreed to get into the squad car during his arrest, which proved fatal this past summer. Brian, got to ask a legal question here. The judge allowed the video to be made public that we just watched and said it couldn't be used as evidence. Now, that makes sense to me, at least, from an open record standpoint, release the video. It might make sense from a relevance standard to not put it into evidence. But then the judge said a transcript of the video could be used at trial. So why the transcript, but not the video we just watched? I have no clue. There are some times that you have judges who are going to try to, for lack of a better term, split the baby to kind of make everyone happy, make the media happy, make the defense attorney happy, make the prosecutor happy. But in doing so, don't really achieve anything. I, I don't see how you can let the transcript in, but not the video. That's bewildering. Yeah, it's strange to me. Terry, does this make any sense to you? Like, like the transcript is going to somehow tell the jury more than the video would? You know, Aaron, I agree with Brian here. It makes no sense at all. Why let the transcript and not the video? And the other issue is the judge is saying that the public can see it. But if the public sees it, then there is the potential that jurors might see it, future jurors might see it. So to me, it's either all or nothing. Don't let any of it in or make sure that, you know, all of it gets in. So this sort of yeah. splitting the baby isn't going to solve the issue for the judge as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and we've got a best evidence rule that would, at least in my interpretation, suggest, Terry, that this gets in because then people can watch it and read the transcript. That's right. Let it all in. I agree with the transparency. It should get in. And I think it would help, frankly, Floyd's position or his family's position. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways to argue about what we see in that video. But apparently the decision is the jury gets the transcript and not the video itself. Well, coming up after the break here on Law and Crime Daily, a New York trial judge and his wife caught on body camera video in a confrontation with police that you won't want to miss. And family of murder victim Lacey Peterson is not happy that her husband Scott may ultimately get a new trial over her murder. We're back after this. The family of murder victim Lacey Peterson is reportedly disgusted. A court ordered a review of her hus of Lacey's husband's conviction. Husband Scott Peterson was found guilty of murdering Lacey and their unborn child, Connor, on Christmas Eve 2002. But the state's highest court is now telling a San Mateo County judge to determine if Peterson should get a new trial. The high court agreed a juror committed prejudicial misconduct by not disclosing she was a victim of a crime in her past. A source close to Lacey's family told People magazine that the family is stunned and that the court's decision is a nightmare. Peterson's death sentence was overturned this summer in a separate appeal. Peterson's trial attorney, Mark Garagos, told Law & Crime Daily recently that Peterson is innocent. What it means, and if you play it out, there's no way they convict him. I, I just don't believe that's going to happen. I mean, people can talk about he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. The fact is, nobody knew, knows or knew that evidence better than our team did in real time. And there wasn't a single person on the team who didn't feel as if they, there was a complete collapse of any evidence. By the way, including the trial judge at various times during this case, there is no, to my mind, justice that has been for Lacey, for Scott, for Connor, or for either of the families. 
Let's jump in for some discussion here. So, Terry, we're in this area of legal theory, especially in the state of California, where victims' rights are paramount. So does it, it surprise you, though, that Lacey Peterson's family is expressing this outrage? Because they have a lot of constitutional provisions and uh, other legal authorities in California that basically are on their side in this case. Well, that's right. They do have some victims' rights, and one of those rights is restitution. They also have the right to be heard. We've heard all the victim impact statements in other cases. But here, they really can't do much. First, the death sentence was overturned. Now, the court is going to reexamine the conviction. And really, it is up to the prosecution. They have discretion to determine whether or not they're going to go forward. So here, the victim's family really doesn't have any rights as far as reviewing the case is concerned. They're going to have to sit through another trial if that's where we come out here. And sadly, they're going to have to listen to all of that once again if that is, in fact, what happens at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, victims have constitutional rights in California, but where they go up against the rights of the defendant, oftentimes the defendant's rights prevail here in a case like this, Brian. The harsh reality is that oftentimes moves, moves defense attorneys like yourself have to make will upset a victim's family. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, we as defense attorneys have to compartmentalize and we have to focus on the job at hand, and that's representing our client as best as possible within the guidelines of the law. And we can't really take into consideration other people's feelings, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we hope justice comes out of a case like this. Uh, was justice served the first time? A lot of people think that it was, but it's going to be up to the judge whether to grant a new trial here. When we come back here on Law & Crime Daily, a New York State trial judge captured on police body camera dropping the names of high-powered supporters and relatives on the force before he and his wife ultimately end up in handcuffs. A New York State Supreme Court judge is facing criticism after body camera video showed him threatening to use his political and legal connections against a group of Buffalo police officers who were trying to break up a disturbance. Body camera video shows the profanity-laden encounter. The police tried to put the judge's wife in handcuffs and in a squad car after she kept screaming at officers trying to interview neighbors. A man identified as the judge can be heard saying the police shouldn't touch his wife and then threatening to use his friendship with the mayor, for instance, and other police officers who happen to be relatives to deal with the matter. The man identified as the judge even shoves the officers and they shove back at one point. Here's where things became heated. We've cut out the cussing. Ma'am, if you don't stop yelling, this is going to be a problem for you. Okay, cool. Then get over here. You're not here to rescue. I sure am. My son, no. You're not. We are not doing this right now. We are not doing. No, it's okay. Him. You better get off the fucking Let him, let him, let him, let him arrest me. I don't care. Go. Come on, take. You're going in the back of the car. And we can deal with this. No, you have no idea. You okay. Can't put up with. Okay, push your hands behind your back. We are gonna have a problem. Put your hands behind your back. Listening to you scream. Why? Because it's the truth. It's no, because I want everybody talk. Okay, so the video also shows the man identified as the judge saying he's calling who he identifies as relatives on the police force. He then goes on to explain the dispute started over where his so called troublemaker neighbors parked their vehicles. And he also drops the name of the city's mayor, Byron Brown, who he said was a friend. How much you a second so we can talk to you? Yeah, I'm talking to my daughter as a police officer. Okay. 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 Ashley and Moya. I don't Dave know Cole. Is. You have three police officers you want to hear. Start the story. Hi, Luch. Luciano. I don't know. You got you, you got officers Mullahan. I don't know who these guys are, but Maria's in the back of the car. Where does your daughter work for? She's in B District. Bravo. My son's in C District. They can't wait to start problems. Okay. Okay. And listen, I'm good friends with Byron Brown. He's like, you know, we saw Mark, just ignore him. I did ignore him. I called and said, the truck is Mark blocking half the driveway. And then when we come back, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like this, he's going to punch me in the face. And I'm getting a fat lip. I wouldn't have my shirt ripped 
like this. He right tore the shirt, grabbing me, and ripped my necklace off. Okay. Okay. Like, like, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm fighting the guy. Okay, there's a lot of that video there. Later on, the police put the man identified as the judge who you just saw there in handcuffs. And then there was another screaming match that ensued. So, Terry, any guess as to why no criminal charges were filed against the judge in this case? And Brian's already losing it. So, Terry, please uh, say your piece now. <laughs> Well, I think the charges were not filed because they are well connected and this was sort of a professional courtesy. I mean, they said there were no charges filed because the judge didn't tackle anybody, he didn't really punch anybody, he just sort of gave a shove. But honestly, it is because the judge and his wife have family who are, you know, authority and they know a bunch of people. And so it was kind of like wink, wink, professional courtesy. We're not going to charge anything against you. Okay, Brian. So the New York Times is reporting that the judicial conduct authorities in New York State are looking into this, investigating. Is that the only remedy here for this particular situation? Well, I, part of me wants to add, ask that question, but, but I got to back up here, Brian. Sorry. How many of your clients can shove a cop and then not be charged? Okay. So assault of an officer, uh, resisting arrest, potentially when you threaten a governmental agent to stop doing their job, potentially we're talking about defelony terroristic threats. All of these are crimes punishable by, by up to maybe like seven and a half, ten years. All that he committed. He's not the right hue for, to be arrested for those charges. He's too well connected to be arrested for those charges. And that's not a remedy because nothing's going to happen. It's going to be investigated, slap on the wrist. He'll be back on the bench by next year. Brian, I have a feeling that you're going to continue to watch this video long after the end of this broadcast. Thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law & Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. Don't really jump to conclusions. We break down the case of a serial killer. Another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law & Crime Network is everywhere. And we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law & Crime.